Welcome to the Hidden Bookcase, come through and get cosy. Pick a book, your favourite book, that's the one that opens this room. Inside you'll find a warm fire, a loving cat, and a wide skylight to the stars. And a dangerously high to be red pile. I'm Morgan, I use they them pronouns, and I am a glitter jar as gender. I'm Soren, I use he him pronouns, and I am a radioactive cat. We've been friends for over a decade and are always swapping books. Each fortnight we take it in turns to recommend one another a favourite read. The first time reader tells us what they know about the book, makes some predictions about what they don't, and then we discuss our thoughts with all of you bookworms. On our shelf this month are some waterlogged books. So today, let's get to talking about... Lake Law by Anna Marie Mugglemore. So everyone, welcome to our second episode of Moist Month. I hope you're all feeling great. (laughs) You're too proud of yourself. (laughs) It's simply iconic. (laughs) Sorry. I really regret suggesting this. Yes. <laughs> Tell me about your book for Moist Month. My book for Moist Month is Anna Marie McLemore's Lake Law, which is about two neurodivergent non-binary teenagers, one of whom used to occasionally visit a world under a lake filled with mystical animal combinations, and one who recently moved to this lake and they met once as children and now they've met again. And they're trying to deal with all of their repressed issues <laughs> and also maybe fall in love. And where did you first discover this book? I think it was just that it was the next McLamora coming out after whatever the one before. I think it was Dark and Deepest Red before this. I think we've done sort of two in a row of theirs. Oh, then maybe the Mirror Season came out in between those two. That's correct. Mirror Season came out between those two. I remember being in Forbidden Planet with you and you being like, do I buy Lake Law or Mirror Season? I don't know. Yes. And eventually bought Lake Law. So Morgan was there. I chose it over the Mirror Season because it was more what I was in the mood for at the time. And then you didn't read it for like six months. Yeah, then I put three books on the floor for a TikTok and had my cat choose. And Natcha decided she liked this one. Because radioactive cats, obviously. Because radioactive cats, she knew it was in there. She's very smart. She's read them all, actually. Speaking of radioactive cats, I don't think this is a segue. (laughs) Should we listen to your blind reaction? Absolutely. Blind reaction? That wasn't good. That was really bad. I think we should cut that out. (laughs) I think we should keep it in just for that reaction. Okay, so I've read a couple books by Anna Marie McMurray before, so I know that we're going to be vibey. We're going to be magical realism. Um, There's going to be trans characters. Um, It's going to feel really romantic. Um, uh, For the actual plot, I don't know anything about it. I mean, I'm assuming there's a lake. Um, I've been told there are no mermaids. There are coral i want to say growing out of the characters on the front cover unless they're butterfly wings but i'm assuming context wise they're coral um so transformation um yeah that's all i can think of it's such a pretty front cover um but i have no idea what the plot is yeah i'm just really excited to read it you know i also thought it was plants i thought it was kelp or something Mm. But I guess it's pieces of lake. I love the cover, do not get me wrong, I love the palette. Mm -hmm. But the foam on the butterfly wings, it doesn't feel very watery to me. I feel like the actual scales look a lot more like light shining through water can look that sort of lattice that you get out of shadows. Yeah. Looking at this cover, it made me think, oh my god, they're turning into sea creatures and coral, and it's like a metaphor for being trans. You turn into random nature. It wasn't that. It was still cool, but it wasn't that. And I feel like I've been on such like a horror bent recently. That my brain just automatically goes, ah, yes, they're going to transform into mm. creatures. Yes, that's where it's going. Especially after reading Our Wives. I can definitely see where you get that from. It is such a good cover. And I love how many times the butterfly wings appear through the book. Yeah, as little chapter decorations. It's pretty. And I like that the ones, if you look at them closely on the cover, some of them only have one sort of wing, in inverted commas. So you can kind of tell that they're not actual butterflies, possibly. They're just... Mm pieces of water that's cool it looks like someone's poured ink into the water Mm. which i love because they are pouring all of their trauma into the water instead of burying your trauma just drown it (laughs) i feel like the lake's got to have some opinions on this like um i don't want this with the animals i guess that's one thing because they're going to live down there but when laura's just straight up pouring paint into the lake (laughs) I know that you're trying to process, but I can't be good for the wildlife. And, you know, introducing new animals into an established ecosystem, Bastion, that can be very dangerous. Mm. I know it's magical realism, but there's always that tiny bit in my mind that's like, they're made of paper mache. 
But I feel like it's dry under the lake. That was kind of the vibe that I was getting. Although at the same time... How are they getting in the lake? Like, what's happening? Explain the physics of magical realism to me right now. <laughs> I was imagining the lake peeling off as if it was like, I don't know, a trap door opening. That's mm. not a very magical description. Where does the water go? Does the water level rise because it's being shifted out of the way? <laughs> Morgan, why are you complaining to me about a soft magic system? <laughs> this is not right. This is incorrect. What is going on? The way they were just so chill. They're like, oh my god, the entire town's flooding and everything's a weird colour. Must be my trauma. They were incredibly relaxed. I understand that this is because it's actually a metaphor, but mm. I feel like you'd be a bit more like, what the f*** just happened? Bastion maybe not, because they've been doing this for a long time. But At the beginning, Bastion's like, yeah, I tell everybody and try to explain to them, and they could never find it. I feel like the adults around them would have been a little bit more concerned as they kept talking about it. I don't know, because if they're a little kid, imaginary friends and stuff get written off all the time. Yeah, but the older you get... Yeah, but how long did they keep trying? Because how old are they when they meet? Nine. Had they not already given up by the time Law got in? Mm, yeah. Because I think they were surprised that it opened for Law. They could have been seven or eight when they stopped. But still, remarkably chill vibes. <laughs> no, I think Law should have been a bit more freaked out, because this happened to you when you were like nine years old on a field trip. Would you not kind of think that maybe you imagined it? Just opening up a book and being like, why are you blue? <laughs> Very much, this might as well happen. Yeah, I understand it's because that's how magical realism works and you just have mm. to roll with the metaphor and yeah, there's no do. time to like start freaking out. So, what else was in your blind? I said it was going to feel romantic. I didn't want to say there's going to be romance Yeah, because I think there's a difference between it's going to feel romantic and there'll be romance. And the way that Nakamura writes, it sort of romanticizes people and relationships, but in a very sort of realistic way. It's very soft. Yeah. Every time you read a book, you go in knowing that everything's going to be okay and that it's basically telling you you're going to be fine. The characters are going to be fine. Thinking back to When the Moon Was Ours. That was also magical realism, and it was also very much, we're here for the vibes, and there's a rose growing out of this character's wrist, and you just have to go with that. <laughs> don't ask questions. We don't have time. <laughs> it just felt very soft, the way the two characters interacted at all times. They were just very gentle with each other and very sort of healing to each other. That's what their writing style is, especially when it comes to relationships. It's very much, we are both very broken people, and we're going to learn to heal together and be our own people and heal separately and then heal together. Yeah, I think that's kind of their brand. Here with Law being like, I'm not interested in you that way. And Bastion being fine with it. All of the characters feel like friends first. It's not necessarily mm. this big dramatic falling in love at first sight thing. The romance feels, I don't want to say incidental because that's not the right word, but complementary, I guess, to yeah. the friendship, which usually blossoms first. Yeah. I wonder if that's why they do so many childhood friends to lovers. It feels a little bit like the same characters falling in love over and over again in different worlds, which I kind of love. Mm. It doesn't become predictable. It's just like, oh, I get to see them fall in love again. Let's see how. A bit like cracking open an alternate universe fanfic. <laughs> exactly. And I feel like it's probably quite influenced by the author's own life. I think in the author's notes of When the Moon Was Ours, they said that that couple was inspired by their relationship. I wouldn't be surprised if that's continually true. And I don't know if you read the author's notes for this one. I skimmed them. Which, you know, we're getting better than the last time, because last time I just didn't even bother. Because McLemore talks about having both ADHD and dyslexia. You can tell that this is semi-biographical. Yeah, I could very much tell that this was quite autobiographical. Especially the ADHD one. I was like, ooh, <laughs> yep, let's not unpack that right now. The first time I read this, Bastion said something really specific about their experience with ADHD. And I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that that was also a symptom of ADHD. Hmm, that's, that's sitting really close to home. And then I forgot it. <laughs> Amazing. No official diagnosis, but can definitely relate to the everything about Bastion. So that's fun. Yep. But I like how it discusses how neurodivergence intersects with things like a trans identity or mm. just with being raised female. Reading two trans characters, specifically two non-binary characters, mm. just healed something inside my soul. I rarely see non-binary characters, and to see two of them falling in love. Exactly. On the rare occasion you do come across a book with multiple non-binary characters, or any media with multiple non-binary characters, it's because the setting is markedly different from our world. Neon Yang's The Black Tides of Heaven comes to mind, and I know it has a lot of non-binary characters, I haven't read it myself yet, but I also know that children aren't raised with a gender in that setting and make that choice for themselves when they're older. So those non-binary identities exist within a very different framework. A similar thing goes for the Wayfarer series and things like that. So it's really nice to have multiple non-binary characters without there being a, in inverted commas, a reason or a justification for that. Flocking together. 
congealing like water molecules. Yes. How do we feel about the writing style? It's vibey. It's typical McLemore fair, but that's a compliment. Yes. Very descriptive, very emotionally intelligent, says what it wants to say in very easy to read terms. It's very accessible. It feels very YA, but in like a very good way. They're very good at unique descriptions without leaning into erudite language or concepts that their audience isn't going to understand. And it's very good at not introducing you to the concepts of ADHD and dyslexia, but giving you understandings of them in a really nice sort of organic way. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it's all that the characters are, despite it being sort of their main conflict, arguably, in this novel which is nice, because I think you could easily boil them down to that, especially in such like a short novel. It was like a little bit info dumpy, but I didn't mind mm. it, because the whole point of the story was exploring these characters' identities yeah. and how they experience these things. I agree with that. I liked it a lot more than the last McMorrow we did, because I felt so much safer <laughs> when I was reading it. Now you've just built up trust with McLemore because you knew that Dark and Deep has ended with a queer commune. I'm like, okay, they're not on the pyre. This is fine. Yeah. <laughs> a, there was less risk, but B, I could trust that there was going to be a happy ending because I've read two books now. Twice is coincidence, three times is a pattern. Yeah, having read all of the other ones apart from The Mirror Season and Self Made Boys at this point, they don't do on happy endings, which I think, you know, writing queer characters of colour, we need more happy endings. So I'm very happy with that. Yeah. I thought this was a funny one to read directly after Our Wives Under the Sea just because. <laughs> <laughs> some of the horror elements i mean like it's not horror but you know what i mean there's something about the moments when they're all alone in the house and they're hearing laughter in the walls and everything's these lurid colors that almost feels mm. like horror i would actually love to read a genre bent version of this book which leans into the horror elements that could mm. have been there the way that it's written they don't really give you the option to see it as horror because they're like don't worry this is all for their betterment as characters i would love to see a version where the characters are being haunted drowning in their dreams everything's weird colors and it's very overwhelming and over i would love to read that i think you would have to end up with a longer novel if you wanted to get them back to the same place of acceptance because the problem here is that it very much represents all of their sort of repressed and inverted compass failings. So you would need time for them to build up acceptance to it and realise that it wasn't as horrifying as it first appeared. But I'm with you on that. I think if it had been longer, it had been scarier at the beginning for them. And that might have supported the themes better. I love the idea of like an eldritch lake entity being like, I'm going to teach you to accept your problems, but not understanding that that's terrifying. It's a terrible method of doing so. <laughs> they're like, isn't this pretty? And they're like, oh my God, I'm going to drown. <laughs> Where are my parents? <laughs> Oh, I love that so much. Who is your favourite character? I feel like with this, it's very much between Sebastian and Law, because they're kind of the only two characters in the book, which I'm not saying is a criticism. I like that. Mm. It's revolving around the two of them and their connection. I feel like all their books are very closed cast, but I kind of love that. It's very sort of like intimate. Yeah. I can't choose between my children, though. I'm struggling. I don't know. <laughs> Sebastian is very relatable to me personally, just in the way that their brain works. But I like how weird Law is, and I feel like Law is more themselves a lot of the time, despite repressing certain things. I just love them. I like them just dropping trivia on Bastion in the middle of a random conversation for no reason. I love how many times Bastion's like, how did we get here in the conversation? Like, Bestie, you do this too. <laughs> what about you, though? I feel like it has to be Law. Bastion's struggle with ADHD, something I feel... A lot, like I'm undiagnosed, but oh boy, oh boy. There are so many things in their experience when I'm like, oh, I thought that was a different disorder that I was trying to get diagnosed for, but maybe it's all just the ADHD. That's cool. Mm. That's great to know. Thanks. But I think law, they have a more similar connection to me in terms of their non-binary experience. Mm. I most of the time present femme. In, yeah. in real life. And I know for a fact that I am perceived almost universally as a woman reading a character who does sometimes present that way. And that sort of rage, understanding that it's never going to go away and that most people aren't going to check. Yeah. But that sort of slowly building, like, I am so sick of this. It's that little bit of my soul that just dies a little bit inside every time I'm at work. And I get misgendered. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I really liked seeing that because, as well, I feel like so many non binary characters in media have to either be completely androgynous. You don't mm. ever get characters who feel comfortable in their assigned at birth gender expression. Yeah. 
it's always that they've sprinted to the opposite direction as far as they can. You know, if you're AFAB, you have to present masculine. And if you're AMAB, you have to present feminine. It's nice to see a character who feels comfortable, you know, wearing lipstick. And also just the rage. I loved their rage so much. I was like, yeah, I want to punch someone in the face too. I mean, I know we were deconstructing the fact that like, maybe that wasn't the best course of action, but also like, maybe it was. I mean, I feel like at the end of the novel, it's kind of like, ah, nah, he deserved it. You were standing up for yourself. Yeah, it was really satisfying. <laughs> to be honest (laughs) and they're out here being like this is terrible i'm a terrible person and i'm like nah man are you though exactly i support you i think it's nice to see from a young adult novel because i feel like it could go the patronizing way of like violence is never the answer and it's like when structural oppression is in play and the system will not help you sometimes you have to defend yourself actually Mm -hmm. it's nice to see that it's quite cathartic yeah Law's gender stuff also kind of vaguely reminded me of you the first time I read this. But obviously I'm not you, so I don't know how you perceive your own gender, etc. Because it's weird, because like, there's masculine days and there's feminine days, and that's really weird that you wake up and you've got to give yourself a gender forecast. And sometimes the gender forecast changes halfway through the day and you're like, ah, beans. Mm, mm-hmm. I don't like this anymore. And I liked the nuances of it. They already know that Bastion is non-binary, and mm. then they're still nervous about presenting Fem around Bastion because they don't know how they're going to react. Mm. which I really liked because I think from the outside perspective there's an assumption that all trans people think the same slash are going to be fine if in a room together but I know firsthand I've been in rooms with people who are majority trans who are still misgendering one person in the corner because they're AMAB and they present that way it's still concerning to come into a space and go are they going to think less of me because I'm presenting like my assigned gender I feel like the intros we do at the beginning of every episode are like the gender forecast they're very reminiscent actually (laughs) Gender is wiggly. Sometimes you feel like a forest of trees, and sometimes you feel like a skeleton, and sometimes you feel like a sky. Sometimes you feel like none house with left grief. <laughs> sometimes you feel like none house with left grief. Sometimes you feel like a war crime. It is what it is. <laughs> I wonder what this would be like to read as a cis person. <laughs> because I feel like there's lots of bits of it that are kind of explanatory in terms of gender, mm. but then there's explanation but no justification. Does that make sense? Yeah. It would be interesting, yeah. Because I feel like the only other book I can think of that I've Mm. read that actively talks about what it is to be non-binary, that Mm. I know cis people who have read it, was Felix Ever After. Yeah, so I think it would be interesting to watch a cis person read this and be like, your gender is a sky full of stars? Could you elaborate? Exactly. To both of us, we're like, yeah, of course. I have no further questions. I did like that being included because I think that sort of thing is so maligned. Years ago on Tumblr, the whole other kin thing with people identifying as things like star gender or cat gender, which people still do. And I'm not trying to say it like it's a phase or something because I know that that's how some people choose to describe their identity. But I like that it's not made fun of here. It's just... Yeah. Yeah. People just sort of call it cringe a lot and stuff, which is just mean. Come on, guys. Do people not understand metaphor? Yeah, it kind of does give that vibe, doesn't it? If someone's like, I'm star gender, and it's like, ha, huh, that kid literally thinks that they're a star and that star is a gender. I feel like you're the same kind of person that just goes, oh, well, the curtains are blue just because, and actually I've never listened to anything in my English literature class. <laughs> maybe, maybe the same kind of person. Also, considering the amount of things that cis people randomly decide to gender... Exactly. Cis people have a very defined set of pictures sometimes for what gender is, and it will be like a lawnmower and a gun. I was also thinking gun, which is horrifying. (laughs) Considering all of that, it's just giving us more words to say the thing. That's what metaphors are. Precisely. It does make sense that McLemore would be good at it, given how association-based their writing is. Yeah. I think they should just tweet their daily gender forecast, actually, just so I can see it, because I think it would be good. Yeah. I just want to know. Morgan. You're the person that read Lake Law for the first time, so you have to answer first. What are your final thoughts? Very vibey, incredible vibes, vibes over the top. I really enjoyed it. It was an easy read in the terms of my brain, yeah. um, which considering I was very ill at the time, I enjoyed a lot. That was a good choice then, accidentally. <laughs> yeah. And it just made me feel very warm. 
and held like a hug. Five out of five. What about you, Sarah? I really love this, obviously, because I was like, I want to talk to Morgan about it. <laughs> it's really nice. It's McLemore's beautiful writing style. It shines through. It's some very good character development in a short space of time. I think if I had one niggle, it would be that occasionally the very short chapters combined with the fact that they're all in first person very occasionally made me go, who's talking? Yeah. Until I realised who was talking. I know the name was right there, but I do you think I read the name? So and maybe if it was just in third, but then also it's very confessional. So I think the first person works very well. Mm. But I think if their voices had been slightly more different, it would have been absolute perfection for me. So for that reason, it's like an extremely high four. <sighs> but if it had lent into the horror, I think that would have definitely lunched out to five for me. I love this so much. I'm trying to be analytical and objective here. So it's a four. <laughs> but like, it's really, really good. And I think you should read it. And if people were looking for something of similar vibes, what would you suggest? I have a rogue suggestion. Please start us off. So first of all, you should listen to Midst, the podcast, for incredible vibes. I'm going to suggest The Raven Boys. Oh, no, I know what you mean. By Maggie Stiefvater. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because it's very magical realism and metaphor as healing and coming to terms with your own identity. But also it has something we didn't discuss about the book, but that sort of liminal feeling of mm. summer. Yeah. Specifically the time before you go to school. They have very similar vibes in that everything sort of elides and feels the same. And you go through whole character journeys in that summer, but it feels very unreal. So that's my rogue hot take. So what I will say, definitely read more of McLemore's work because they have a very consistent tone and style. And if you like it, I think you will continue to like it. And the one I'm going to recommend I haven't read in a while, but I do remember really absolutely loving it. I have rated it five stars on Goodreads, which is rare for me. So I don't know how I would rate it if I reread it. But Aristotle and Dante discover the secrets of the universe, which there's also a sequel recently, which I have not read. But it also has that sort of strange liminal summer setting. It also features water very heavily and links swimming to queerness, I guess. I don't really know how to put that. I see that, actually. And then also a Latin American author who is queer, writing about queer characters. But that is contemporary and has no fantasy elements. <gasps> so I have to warn people of that on this show because we are a science fiction fantasy show. Yeah. I might also quickly toss out Ocean at the End of the Lane. <gasps> yes. Oh my God. Yes, 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 yes. That has a similar vibe. Neil Gaiman, magical realism, water, adjusting to a major change in your life. Magic as metaphor. Yeah, exactly. And then weirdly, the other one that I was thinking of, actually, I'll just say it now, Peter Darling, which we've already done on the show. Ooh, ooh, ooh. But there's just something about him. I think it's about that thing of finding connection, especially with one of the characters being trans and showing those parts of yourself that you don't like to somebody else and being accepted anyway. Yeah. It just feels reminiscent. And we have a whole episode on that one. So you can go <laughs> listen to it if you read it, or you can listen to it without reading it. I'm not your dad. <laughs> for July, we are going to be reading books for Disability Pride Month, and I'm starting us off this time with God Killer by Hannah Kainer, which I'm so excited for Morgan to read. And I know Morgan has been waiting to read this because they pre-ordered a copy <laughs> and it's been months. I am sorry, but we've got to it now. Yeah. Finally. And we will also be having a guest for this episode. One of my friends, India from India Reads A Lot. Very exciting. She's also been very excited ever since she found out about the podcast. She's like, I want, I want a guest. Amazing. I'm so excited. <laughs> Until then, you're always welcome through the bookcase. Don't forget to scratch the cat on your way out. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Bookcase, a production of Plain Up Prod. On this episode, you heard Morgan Greensmith and Soren Brywood discussing Lake Law by Anna Marie McLemore. You can find out more about this book at author.annamariemclemore.com, and you can follow McLemore at Marie on Twitter. You can find The Hidden Bookcase on Twitter at Hidden Bookcase, and on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, and TikTok at Hidden Bookcase Podcast. Find out more about Plain Up Prod at plainerprod.com. Know what we should read next? Or want to chat to us about what we thought of this episode's read? You can reach us at thehiddenbookcase at gmail.com, or send us a DM on social media. We'd love to hear from you. If you're enjoying The Hidden Bookcase, please consider leaving us a rating or a review, or you can always tell a friend how to find us. Your whispers are the best way for bookworms to discover our show. July is Disability Pride Month. On our next episode, which will be out on Monday, July the 3rd, we'll be discussing God Killer by Hannah Kainer, along with India from India Reads A Lot. We hope to see you then, and in the meantime, you're always welcome through The Bookcase. <laughs>